So welcome everyone to Wellness Spring. Today I'm really blessed to be with a truly special lady who's so dynamic and her fates are truly extraordinary. She, her name is Mitra Lundy. She is an author of Detox for Life and a well sought after speaker, coach, and the CEO and owner of Kinetics Personal Training Group and um, Fitness. And I know from Little Birdies that she actually saved her life. And I am so grateful to a communal friend, Marie Shanahan, for introducing us. So welcome everyone and welcome Mitra to Wellness Spring Podcast. I'm so glad to be here with you and um, and I'm so glad to be with your audience. So thank you. Thank you. And before we delve into your absolutely amazing achievements, could you please tell the audience a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, your family, your education and so forth? Sure, sure. So uh, my name is Mitra Lundy and um, I live in the United States. I live in New Jersey, in central New Jersey. I was born in central New Jersey, but I've lived a couple of places, southeast primarily. Um, but I'm in New Jersey right now. And um, I am a mother. I have two beautiful daughters, uh, one who's 29 years old. She actually just turned 29 in June. And I have another daughter who's 24. Um, so I'm so very proud of my of my young women. I don't call them girls anymore. I call them young women because that's what they are. And um, I'm an entrepreneur. I've been in business for myself for the last 14 years. And I wear many hats as an entrepreneur. Those entrepreneurs out there, you know, you um, we do a lot of different things. So uh, day to day. I am at my fitness studio coaching and training clients, but I also have a staff of 10. And um, in 2019, I uh, self-published my first book called The Detox Life. And in 2020, I produced a documentary called A Walk in Her Shoes. And um, I do quite a bit of speaking. I actually have... Um, my first international uh, uh, speaking opportunity in Kenya in September. So that's going to be amazing. Yeah. Wow. That's, that is amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. And um, you covered a lot there. Um, what did your parents do? And did you always want to be in fitness and health and so forth? Sure, sure. So I think it's interesting. Um, usually the thing that we, the things that we decide that we're going to do with our lives is completely different than what we choose when we're young. You know, I was young and just like everybody else, maybe I was, I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to, you know, at one time I wanted to be a midwife. And so uh, that, you know, as a child, those were my childhood dreams. But looking back on that, it was really my grandmother who made a really big impression on me in being in the fitness industry. My grandmother was uh, an amazing woman who raised eight beautiful daughters. She was from um, South Carolina. Um, and um, she raised her daughters with her husband, Russell Donald. But my grandmother was, for most of her adult life, for as long as I knew her, she was overweight and um, had a lot of health issues. You know, I would see her bring out her pill box. And in the pill box, there were like, I don't know, 10 pills in each one. And I'd help her sort it, sort it all out. Um, and so I grew up watching her take the pills. Um, but also my grandmother was tragically uh, killed in a fire. And um, she died from smoke inhalation um, because she was physically not able to get herself out of the house. And that really made a huge impression on me. Um, I subconsciously made a decision that I wanted to be in really great shape 
I wanted to be able to take care of myself and my body. Um, and I wish my grandmother would, would have been able to get herself out of that house. Um, but I also wanted it for my family. So her daughters um, and my children and nieces and nephews, I have a really big family. And so when there are family functions, I am the one who talks about health and wellness. I am the one who's at the you know, uh, Thanksgiving uh, meals, uh, telling everyone that we need to go for a walk before or after the meal. So um, I, I hold um, that uh, responsibility and my family for making sure that everyone is paying attention to the health and, and, and wellness. Um, I hold that really as, a, as an important role that I play. And so uh, you know, my grandmother made the biggest influence uh, on me being in the fitness industry and, and just being in health and wellness. So, Oh, thank you. First, I would like to honor your grandmother. And I'm so sorry for her tragic transitioning um, because, you know, it must have been horrifying to be, die from inhalation of the smoke and see the flames and everything around you. Yeah. Um, um, as regards large family, I'm from a large family as well. So um, I was one of six and, you know, so you can imagine what it's like. And like you, I'm the only one into health and wellness. So I played that role as well. So it's good to know we got that in common. And um, you covered a lot. And I know I read that you saved your own life. Like what was wrong with you? You know, what symptoms did you have? Because um, I, I put on the little reel yesterday, one of my nieces was in and out of hospitals and the doctors couldn't find out what was wrong with her. She had pains in her tummy, that she had magic eyes here, there and everywhere. They couldn't find anything wrong. And then she read an article on FODMAP and it's all about having too much fructose. And she took the initiative because she'd seen so many therapists, so many doctors and specialists she changed her diet to um, a low FODMAP diet and she's like a new person. Wow. Like she's changed her life just by not having fructose. And I didn't ask Marie and I haven't asked you. I'm just curious, you know, wow. what was going on in your life? Sure, sure. So um, I really believe that there are significant moments in our lives that mark a um either a transformation or a moment where we're just, or moments when we're just stagnant. And in 2018, I went through a, it began a huge transformation for me, uh, for me and for my life. My daughters um, had moved out. So I was at the beginning stages of uh, being an empty nester. And I'm one of those individuals who is very, um, calculated. And so coming out of high school, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I, I organized it all. And so um, you grow up with this identity. And so I was very certain about my identity up until 2008. By this time, I already have a fitness facility. I am, um, you know, I've been in business for many years. Um, I've been a mom for many years and I've been a wife for many years. Um, and in 2018, it felt like I wasn't the same kind of mom. So my daughters had left. My youngest daughter, she struggled with uh, some mental health issues. So it was very difficult for about 10 years of her life. But at 18, she got herself together and they both moved out. Well, simultaneously, I experienced a major health scare um, that I had to have uh, surgery for. Um, it was cancer related. Um, and I was uh, also in the middle of separating from my husband. And so these three major things took the certainty that I had and really just threw it out the window. So, um, you know, I had the physical, uh, the, the physical uh, sort of challenges, just managing the big C. And, you know, I, um, I give a lot of credit to individuals who are able to go through that um, 
you know, pre-diagnosis, diagnoses um, with a clear head because you worry about every part of it. Um, and then to do that with your uh, personal life on the rocks uh, while you know managing, uh, I had a business. And so you know, I had to put on my face and still be a coach. I had to still show up at work. I had to, I had to still manage my staff. And so um, it was very difficult from 2000 and at the end of 2017 through 2018. And I really had, um, Beverly, I really had a decision to make. Um, I, uh, I was depressed and I can say that now, but at the time I was very ashamed of that. But my clients would have never known. Nobody would have ever known. And I got to a point where I was either going to lay still or do something. And I chose to do something. And um, my the documentary that was born was rooted in that sort of life transformation. Um, I chose to follow in the footsteps of a freedom seeker. Um, and by freedom seeker, I mean an individual who at one time was enslaved and sought her freedom. Her name uh, was Harriet Tubman. And she traveled from uh, the Southeast. She was born in Maryland. Um, she traveled to Philadelphia initially to gain her freedom, but eventually had to travel further north. So she uh, found herself in Canada. But not only did Harriet Tubman free herself, she went back uh, many times, um, they say between 11 and 13 times to uh, bring back, to bring her family into freedom. Um, Harriet Tubman is also significant because she, um, she fought for the Union Army and she um, was a nurse. She was a spy. She was a general. She was a woman who won. Um, she she took a group of um, soldiers, uh, black soldiers, uh, into a raid called the Combe River Raid, and she won that um, particular battle or raid um, without any casualties. And she wound up freeing over seven hundred enslaved people. And so. You know, in my mind, at my lowest point, I thought um, if I was going to do something to save my life, it couldn't be a small thing. I had to really reach out and extend myself um, if I was going to make it through this through this time. Um, and and pain is a uh, a remarkable mo a motivator. When we suffer, it challenges us to move. And so um, I decided in two thousand and. 19 to take that uh, to take that journey um, and it happened between June and August I traveled from the eastern shores of Maryland to St. Catharines Canada and uh, the total mileage was 695 and what's wow. so funny is that um, I, I walked 245 of those miles but I was completely prepared and ready to walk the whole, the entire 695. But what happened was in the middle of me trying to figure out myself, I got a better understanding of Harriet Tubman. And it turned out that she didn't walk 695 miles, that she took many modes of transportation, including trains and wagons, and she got help from a, a, a bunch of people. And so um, that single decision to walk from Maryland to Canada has inspired me to learn more about world history, to get a better understanding of my own potential and what, um, what, what my purpose is on this, uh, on this earth. And so, um, you know, I'm alive, I'm well, and um, I'm ready to do the job that's been given for me to do. And so um, I do that to the best of my ability every single day. Wow, that's an incredible story. Oh, my Lord. 
Um, so you were down in the dumps. You were very rock bottom low with these three major things happening in your life. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously, you know, I'm not sure what support team you had around you because you were an empty nester and going through the divorce with all the cancer and everything happening. And then at one of your lowest points, you decided to make this documentary. But what was your experience in film producing and um, everything? Because I know I've watched the trailer and it's incredible. And um, and thankfully, you got to make it before COVID lockdowns, you know, because who knows what your pathway. But when you were thinking, what can I do? What came into your head? How did it come? Who or what inspired you to make this documentary? Sure, sure. So I didn't set out initially to produce a documentary. I was in, I was at a low point. And you know when you're at a low point and you're scrambling and you're yeah. like trying to figure out day to day, how do I get through the next moment? I remember, um, and this is so it, I, I'm, I'm giving it uh, some weight because I'm a very independent person. And for any of the independent people out there, we don't necessarily reach out for help. I, I remember calling my sister in between each client and saying to my sister, you know, I don't really have anything to say, but if you could just be on the phone with me for a little while longer, I can feel whole enough until I see my next client. And even the thought of it right now makes me a little bit teary eyed that I was, that I felt so um, unlike myself, unlike myself. So I didn't start out deciding that I was going to produce a documentary. I decided I have to do something. And my clients, my clients are uh, really remarkable and really wonderful humans and they care about me. And so I didn't want to abandon them and do another project. So I decided to be uh, vocal about what I was doing, um, sort of step into my own integrity because I wanted to make sure that I, I didn't uh, drop the ball in any way. Um, and I wanted to let them know what was going on. And what I didn't realize is I didn't realize that other people um, really honored and respected Harriet Tubman. So when I started talking about her, uh, folks were interested. And I said to the, uh, one of my former staff, Selena, who was the director of the documentary, but she was working for the fitness facility. I said to her, I'm not sure what we're going to do with uh, this, but I'd like for you to come along on the journey. And I'd like for you to take some photos and some videos and let's see what happens. And she was kind enough to agree to that. Um, I had a client who um, was also going through a really tough time. She appears in the documentary. Her name is Kim. And Kim and I were on the phone. Um, I remember it like it was yesterday. It was a Saturday. And I was talking to Kim and I was saying that, you know, we needed to do something. And uh, you know, Kim threw out a bunch of ideas. I threw out a bunch of ideas. And I, uh, we settled on uh, this is the this is the best way to get through this time. Um, and initially, we were just going to trek from Maryland to Philadelphia. Um, but I had this dream that we like I went to sleep and I dreamt that we made it all the way to Canada. And Kim was on board with that. Um, and we recorded everything uh, and documented everything. Um, once I got back. And the journey was complete. So I started it June uh, 27th alongside of Kim. But eventually, Kim and I, we actually have to separate. And part of the documentary talks about what, why we separated, what that separation was like. It was very difficult. Um, but the, the journey comes to an end in August. And once the journey comes to an end, I'm not certain during the journey, at the start of the journey, whether or not what I was doing was going to make me feel better. I was sort of just throwing the rock in the water and just saying, like, I don't know, is the rock going to skip? Let's see what happens. Hoping that I would feel better. 
And um, in September, October, I had all this uh, footage and really had no experience in producing um, a documentary. But I did my homework and Selena was there. She had uh, majored or minored in uh, film. So she and I started storyboarding and um, sort of brought this, gave the story some legs and some direction. And uh, we worked together for you know several months. And then I decided, well, I'll, I'll put it out to a, a few film festivals. And um, it was accepted uh, to the socially relevant films, to socially relevant films um, in March of 2020. And um, it was chosen out of like 600 films. I was like, uh, the film was one of 20. And, uh, and then it won an award. It won the IndiePix Vision Award. And I got contacted by one of the IndiePix uh, agents it was Selena and I sitting in the room and listening to the award ceremony. And when they call out our film, we both looked at each other and, you know, we were sort of in awe. Um, with the entire process because Selena had, she had done portions of the walk with me. And um, she also appears in the documentary. She had a very emotional experience of her own um, and that she appears towards the end of the documentary. Um, and, you know, Indy Picks as a part of the award gave us worldwide distribution. Um, and so that is how the documentary was born. Wow, that's an absolutely, truly inspirational, motivational story. And, you know, for the listeners, if you're thinking of doing something, take tips from the lovely Mitra and just get out there and do it. You know, don't hesitate, just do something. Yeah. You know, that's absolutely incredible. And, you know, I've read... Um, Harriet's story over the years a few times and she was just a truly remarkable lady and I personally was wondering because I've dabbled with acting or you know in because I work with psychiatry and psychology you know you enter the role I was wondering whether you know if you felt that you were walking the actual steps of Harriet and how that affected you or not? Sure, sure. So um, not as an actress, I would say. Um, one of the really beautiful things that's happened, that happened to me while I was on the road, um, it, it felt as if my spirit opened. And I became this, I, I got this instant connection. Wow. Uh, to an energy I had, I, I had not had access to prior. There's something about being out and being on the road and being alone and having to reconcile with yourself. I was grieving. And so it, it felt like I was going through all of the stages of grief. But then I'm also thinking about Tubman. I'm thinking about the other freedom seekers who had lived a life of enslavement and how difficult it must have been for them to, uh, to, to, to live under those conditions. And I thought about the first uh, enslaved folks who were, you know, crossed the transatlantic or crossed the Atlantic Ocean and were dropped off in this new land with this new language and basically were told to work. And then they worked and died and that was the end of them. And so I had the energy of those people in my thoughts and in my body while simultaneously coming into my own awareness. I've been coming into my, to myself. And so I don't think I, it wasn't that I felt like Harriet Tubman. It was that I could feel Harriet Tubman and I still feel her actually, you know, and I don't want, it's not like she speaks to me in my ear. It's like she speaks through my heart. And when a thought pops up and she's there, I was like, okay, I, we're still community, uh, communicating. Um, and it's amazing. And 
uh, she comes to me, but there are other people who also come to me. Um, and so I feel really grateful to be able to be in touch with that energy and that level of awareness. And I really have to give so much, um, so much gratitude to the journey itself, because the connection between the physical movement and the, the energy that was happening inside of me, it, it's been explosive. It's been expansive. And so it, it, part of that is the reason why I really believe in people moving because magic can happen, um, but you've got to be willing to do the work. And, um, you know, I am so much clearer now and so much more willing and, um, and, and obedient and what I know that I'm supposed to be doing. And so, uh, I'm grateful. Wow. Wow. Yes, because I know when you're in the energy field and you're in that zone, you've you embody it. You can't do otherwise. You know, you become that person regardless whether you're, you know, someone in the peripheral or the key people, because that energy is swirling around. And to just honor such a great person, you know. I, you know, I'm very grateful for you for doing it and, you know, to inspire in millions because um, this is brilliant, the work that you're doing. And I totally agree with you about movement as well. You know, we embody something and then we have to shift the energy. And the only person that can do it is yourself, as you know, 100%. And um, I know you've also written a book because I'm not sure is you, you've had all your clears for the cancer and, you know, health wise, I'm sure you're keeping an eye because you're the wellness person in the family. And would you like to tell us about your detox for life book? Sure, sure, sure. So uh, great news. I have a clean bill of health. So I am really, really uh, grateful for that. Um, I wrote that I wrote the detox life in 2019. And then the documentary was born in 2020. So they were happening simultaneously. And um, I make that point because uh, initially I said, we have several times in our lives that I think magic happens, major transformation happens. And some of us were aware of it and some of us blow it off. We ignore it. We don't want to do the work. And I'm so grateful that I didn't ignore it, that it was in my face so much so that I had to do it. And um, the detox life is a book of tools they are the tools that I've used for myself, but also ones that I've used um, for my clients who've shown me this is how I get through um, negative thinking. This is how I get through horrible eating. This is how I manage the way I live, like having a healthy lifestyle. Um, it's everything that I do regularly to check myself. So everything from, you know, dry brushing my skin as a way of uh, cleansing the largest organ to the books that, you know, I read. Um, there are a bunch of stories in there about my clients and how they've struggled to lose weight and how they finally were able to lose the weight and keep it off. There are recipes in there, some of my favorite raw vegan to pescatarian recipes in there. So the book is uh, my voice. It's me on the shoulders of all of the listeners right now. It's just saying like, you've got this. You've got no other choice but to live your life. And it's your duty to come into your own awareness. All right, you feel weak today? It's okay. Tomorrow, get back up, get back on the wagon drink the water. You need water. Reduce the sugar. That stuff's no good for you. So put that to the side, you know, get, here's the workout. There are four workouts that uh, take place over the course of the four weeks. So it's a four week guide. And every week I give a new workout and there's everything in there um, that pulls from functional training. So how to squat, how to hinge, 
how to push, how to pull. Um, and so there are tons of things that are clients who are like, oh, you know, or individuals who are like, oh, I don't work out. I don't know what to do. They could at least start to look at the pages and say like, okay, this doesn't look too difficult. She wants me to balance on a single leg. I could do that. To the person who's like, yep, she's asking me to do 30 push-ups. I'm going to go ahead and do that. And so the Detox Life is a four-week guide to helping clients um, better take care of themselves um, in a way that jumpstarts them. Wow. I can't wait to read the book. I'll have to buy it um, because I'm traveling in a van around Australia and I can do squats and things like that, you know, inside the van. And um, I like to have a routine. So I, I guess that will get me back on track because I've exercised or danced most of my life. So sometimes it's challenging when the weather's raining or you know, we, you're in rocky grounds or, you know, you haven't got smooth land outside to do the exercise. So, yeah. So um, the, the book can be purchased on Amazon so anybody can get it. And what's nice, uh, Beverly, is that some of that stuff you can probably do right in the van, laying flat on your back. There are core exercises that you don't even have to step foot out of the van. You could do it right in the van. So uh, it's available. Great. And um, I I also want to ask you about your um, kinetics business. Mm -hmm. What motivated you to start that? Sure. Um, so kinetics is um, my fitness facility. Um, I've been a fitness business owner for 14 years. It's so odd for me to say 14 years out loud because it seems like yesterday um i've had a brick and mortar for 12 years and um, at my facility i service primarily women between the ages of 30 and 65 but i also have some men who come to the uh, facility usually by way of their wives the wives usually want them to or their partners usually want them to to adopt a healthier lifestyle but I'm, I'm proud to say that my oldest client, um, his name is Peter. Peter is 100 years old. And so he wow. trains twice a week. He never, he never misses. He never misses. And um, he inspires not only me, but all of the clients who interact with him um, to be better and to show up for ourselves. So we had a big party for him last October. So he's, uh, hopefully we get to celebrate um, in the same way this coming October, he'll be 101. Fantastic. Yeah, I've got a friend who's 104. And he, he's not physically fit, because he's partially, partially blind in one eye and blind in the other eye from a fall. Yep. But oh. mentally, he's so alert. And the stories he tells, he's still mentoring business people. And I, I think it's really important to surround yourself as well with positive people. Absolutely. And Peter, and, and um, just like your friend, um, he has all of his wits. Peter told uh, told us during his party that he had just come out with his uh, 66 of his best essays had just been compiled into a book. And I just thought like, this is remarkable. At 100 years old, you're still producing work. You are still um, engaging with people of many ages, and we can still learn from him. And I think wow, like what a blessing to be able to be in his company. Absolutely. And I just want to quickly go back to the dry brushing because I've been doing that for several years. And I I preach it to everyone because, you know, people say, can I do it in the shower? No, it's a dry brush for a reason. And, you know, you're going to get rid of all the toxins that have you know, you can't see with the naked eye that you've been expelling overnight mm -hmm. and because you don't want them to go back into your lymphatic system and your circulation. And I, I'm like, it's such a great way to wake up your day with, you know, waking up your nervous system, your lymphatics, brushing your skin. 
and as you know it makes your skin silky smooth like a baby's bottom <laughs> so, <laughs> no, so. so wait beverly we have to high five because i have not met a fellow dry brusher it's great <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like we've got a lot in common because I'm also vegan and I also cured my own thyroid and um, ovarian cancer, but I did mine naturally through um, laughter. I went to, when I got the diagnosis, they wanted to rush me in straight away and I was like, no, 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 I was just happy to get a diagnosis because I'd been seeing so many people. But once they diagnosed me, I knew the exact time when it happened and the reason because I'd overstretched myself and a friend had let me down. Um, the list goes on. But then we were going to watch the British um, Lions tour in New Zealand. And when the doctors wanted to rush me in because I was like a pin cushion, I had magic eyes, this, that and the other. And um, I said, no, I need to get my head around it. I'm going to go away for two weeks and then I'll see you when I get back. And they were giving my partner, the oncologist, gynecologist, the endocrinologist, they were all giving my partner the mobile phone numbers and trying to get him to dissuade me. But of course, I went away, had so much fun, laughter, singing, using crystals, getting healings. When I came back, it was completely gone. Wow. So, yeah. And I had three three monthly checks and then my reiki master said beverly what are you doing if you keep looking they're going to find something she said wow. bury it away so it's only a couple of years ago that i've started mentioning it but i've been healthy ever since so i think sometimes you know we as you said you have to listen within because you talked about eating you know negative thoughts checking in with your body and eating because a lot of us emotionally eat and you spoke about sugar and I think you saw on the reel I'm in the sugar capital of Australia and I had to Google because I was overwhelmed just driving for miles and miles and miles with sugar cane. And then when I, I only put a tiny note of, you know, how many tons are sent out from Australia and Brazil and globally, it's like so much sugar, wow. you know. Wow. I didn't realize that Australia was such a producer of sugarcane. I didn't realize till I was in the fields. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I, yeah. I have so many clients who, um, who come to us for weight loss in particular. Yeah. And sugar is the first thing that I ask them to reduce. And they usually yeah. don't believe that 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 is an issue. So they're usually surprised by it. Um, but also, you know, all the other elements around us, you know, what our family life is like, what our work life is like, how we manage our stress, what our just lifestyles like. Um, most folks aren't, they just aren't moving around enough. They're eating way too much and they're eating way too much of the foods that they think will help them to stay awake. Um, temporarily and so um we're on the same page about reducing sugar great and um could you mention some of them are overweight can you tell us like for the listeners what's a typical session with you do you do one-on-one -on -one? and obviously you said you've got 10 staff you know if i was to come to you or someone else what are the main reasons and what are programs that you've got for them? Sure, sure. All of our programs start with an initial intake. So you call up or you walk by or you find us online at kineticsnj.com and um, or you send us a text, um, which is also on our website. And you say, hey, um, you know, I'm interested in becoming healthy. Most people they are quite vague on that initial call um, or that initial initial outreach. They want to be healthy. They want to be stronger. Um, and it's not until they come in for that appointment or they have their Zoom consultation where we really spend 30 minutes talking about what made them call at the time that they called. I ask quite a bit of questions about their, their health background, what they've done for 
for fitness in the past, and then what their top three goals are. I ask questions like, why haven't they been able to reach those goals up until this point? I really try to look for a full a picture, explanation of how they came to talk with me at that moment in time. And in doing that, I can make a proper recommendation. Sometimes the recommendation is for them to begin training with us. If they are, if they've got a healthy body, but they want to better manage their weight, they want to improve their strength, um, they're looking to improve their, um, their uh, numbers in terms of blood pressure or cholesterol. These are all clients that we see frequently. But sometimes the, the challenges are bigger challenges and they're outside the scope of what we do. For example, if a client has a previous injury that hasn't been managed by a physician or a therapist, or they are uh, struggling with their nutrition in a way that requires professional help, during that intake, we'll talk a lot about whether or not our facility is the right place or if they should go somewhere else first and then come back to us. What I really love about how we interact with clients is where everybody's moving so fast and um, it's very difficult to hear and be heard. And so we carve out that 30 minutes so that they can so that we can see them and hear them and make sure that what we set up for them is actually going to be something that gives them success. Most clients who come to us who are healthy, they can get some positive results, see changes in their bodies within three months, as long as they're consistent and they're willing to do the work, especially the work of shifting their mindset around food. This is so important. It's 80% of the um, weight loss picture, but it's also 80% of the mindset picture. You really have to decide that this is what you want. Um, and, and maybe it's 100%. Maybe I'm misspeaking because you need 100% of your mind to be in it. And then the other percents for your body and your actions to follow through. And so um, they come to do their intake. And then they have an initial in-person consultation where we physically move or we do that over Zoom. Um, there are many clients who are not in state with us. Um, so we have national clients and they never set foot in the studio, but Zoom is amazing. And so we facilitate or we train um, via Zoom. After that initial consultation where we have to do their assessment, then together the client uh, and I or the trainer, um, we help them figure out what the next steps are. Um, and so that's what a normal intake process is like for us. Wow, it's great. You covered a lot there and you obviously work holistically, look at the whole picture and you make tailor-made programs. And like you said, we're living in a fast-paced world. We're go, go, go. And it's about allowing ourselves the gift of time to stop and slow down. I know when I do Reiki or used to see clients for massage, et cetera, I would do a consultation minimum 30 minutes first because it's allowing them to sit down and hear what they're saying, but most importantly, be heard, be heard by a professional. And that professional can pick up on like yourself on what their true needs really are so Absolutely. it's wonderful and it's great that you're doing the sessions on zoom as well so globally people can sign up with you as well and for people who would like to start out as a personal trainer because you're so successful what tips would you give them sure sure so an individual who wants to go into personal training as a career you mean yeah sure sure um, so the first thing I would say is um, make sure that you're entering the career for the right reasons. So sometimes what we want for ourselves um, is one thing, but you have to be able to deliver that thing to someone else. So being a personal trainer is not about you being in shape. 
It's about you being able to take an individual from one place of fitness to another place. So just because you go to the gym or you know you you eat healthy doesn't mean you could actually coach someone else to do that. So anyone thinking about being a personal trainer should make sure that they're doing it because they want to help someone else. The second thing I would say is find a uh, reputable um, uh, place of, for schooling that um, book knowledge matters um, and experience matters. And so the program that you choose should have a clinical component or an internship a requirement, as well as uh, a lot of these places do self-study or some places do in-classroom study, but to make sure that that clinical component is there, because to read about someone who has um, challenges with their knees and contraindicated movements, to read about it is one thing, but to actually interact with that client and um, have to manage the individual's emotional state of wanting to do whatever you're asking them to do, but physically not being able to do it, that you need the skill to be able to manage the individual, also to understand biomechanics and how to adjust that exercise so it's done safely. Um, and then the last thing that I would recommend is um, be that the person should make sure that they. Um, that they um, have done their due diligence in terms of where they want to be in, in terms of training. Do they want to work for themselves? Do they want to work for a facility and be able to answer why? I've seen tons of people get it, get into personal training and not understand that you should actually work for someone first so that you gain a bunch of experience with customer service. You know, what does it mean to be a trainer? Um, it means that you're dealing with customers. That's just one component. It means that you understand, you know, basic biomechanics and you can uh, cue exercises appropriately. But then there's also, a, you know, the sort of business component. We do a lot of, you know, marketing um online and offline in order to stay relevant, a lot of continuing education. So a personal, a person coming into the industry shouldn't be um, naive to the various components of personal training, and they should be flexible and willing to work for a facility first so that they get enough experience underneath their belt um, that they could um, go into that industry and be successful. Wow, those are three very amazing points, which I'm sure you could apply to all businesses as well. And even it's like being a detective and knowing, you know, exactly what's going on and being alert of what's happening around you and having an open heart and be willing to learn because, you know, a lot of people, like you say, you can read a book, you can do the trick, be a gym junkie, but to actually be in the presence of another being and take them from A to Z is a completely different story. And even like when you mentioned earlier, you know, in your initial consult with a client, maybe um, they don't need your services yet, but to have that awareness, you should see a physio, osteopath, a sports doctor, this, that, or the other. And it's wonderful to hear that you're so thorough with everything and um, all those great tips. But I just want to talking about success and business because personal training is one business, whether you are employed or working for yourself. But you actually have had this building for 14 years and you've got 10 staff. So how do you juggle the staff and for people who want to start up their own business with an employer, the personal trainers, you know, what tips would you give them? What are your success tips? Sure, sure. Um, so uh, it's what I was mentioning before. 
there are a lot of people who enter the fitness industry who want to be entrepreneurs. And I think this is totally a wonderful thing. Um, but I do think that you have to go in with your eyes wide open. And so um, I, when I entered the fitness industry, I was working full-time for a university. I worked at that university for 10 years as an accountant. Now I have a, um, a degree in biology and I have a degree in accounting. And I decided I, I was teaching um, traditional West African dance. I was dancing with a company and I, I was asked to teach. And I had no idea if I would like, why, if I would enjoy teaching. But it turns out I had 40 people sign up for my class and I loved it. And that really was the beginning of me teaching and coaching. Prior to that, um, I, had, I had no desire to train or coach in any, in any way. Well, though that single class turned into several styles of um, teaching fitness, and then eventually um, that became one-on-ones. I first sublet space, so I shared space with another person, and then when I grew out of that, I was still working full-time, so I was working full-time, um, nine to five, and I was training and working in my business from 5 p.m., to 11 p.m. I did this every day for one year. And even before I had a facility, I was training out of the trunk of my car. So I handled all of these things in stages. And so what I would say to anyone who is an entrepreneur and wants to be in the business of fitness, it really depends on where you enter. There are individuals who get in because they want to train and they want to actively uh, work with clients. And then there are ones that just want to uh, pay for the business to exist. So the first thing is to figure out how you want to enter the business of fitness. Are you just an investor? Or are you working in the business? For me, I was working in the business because I wanted the exchange with clients. I was, I was really great at that. After I sublet, uh, sublease, sublet space, then I had my first facility, which uh, com combined fitness and yoga. Um, and then COVID happened. Uh, I'm sorry. Then I opened a second studio in the same town that my yoga studio was in. So I had two spaces. They were uh, sister spaces. COVID happened. I closed one facility and I kept the other one open. And that's where we are right now. My greatest lesson in anybody wanting to open a fitness business, um, to do your research, to make sure you understand where, you, at what, where you're entering in. Are you going to actively train? Or are you just going to invest? And then to give a lot of thought to um, how you're going to make that business successful. A lot of time goes into marketing. A lot of time goes into self-study, self-study about uh, of what I want, um, but also um, working with my, my staff. How do you manage a staff? Is it just going to be you? Um, I got to the point where it couldn't have just been me. I really needed help with that. Um, and so I am constantly learning. I am a student of my life. And so anybody coming into this industry should be a student of their lives and just be certain about the direction that they want to go in. Thank you. That was wonderful. And um, just one quick question before we wind up. Um, if there was one thing you could do to change the world, what would it be? Sure. I would continue to produce work like I'm producing right now. I have, uh, I'm working on a second book. I am going to really enjoy um, that first international talk that I'm doing um, and being able to just spread my wings in that way. And um, I look forward to more films. And so producing the work that sits right in my soul is, um, is what I believe that each, uh, what I want to do. But for each individual, I believe that um, we're all here for a purpose. So you have to produce the work that is sitting in your soul. 
Fabulous. Thank you. And I've put in the chat box all the links to your website, your documentary and book. And um, for people who watch the replay, please put some questions and um, follow the advice of the lovely Mitra. You know, it's so important for all of us to look holistically, keep our bodies moving, eat a healthy diet, have a healthy mind, watch our thoughts and be of service. You know, oh, be of service to others. Thank you so, so much for having me on your show. I so appreciate it and um, the, appreciate you and the work that you're doing to uh, to transform lives. So thank you so much. Thank you. And I appreciate all that you're doing. And please keep shining. You're such an inspiration for us all.